Hello, project for the day. I have this old control panel which was for a blast door on a Titan II missile silo. I picked this up at the Titan II Missile Museum south of Tucson, Arizona, um, I think in 2014. They had a number of them taken from various different silos that were decommissioned and were selling them uh, not really cheaply um, in their uh, gift shop. <laughs> And um, I thought this is my chance to own at least a little piece of a iconic piece of Cold War history. And so I bought the panel, and it was exactly the way they'd hacked it out of a silo when they were dismantling the silo. Somebody would just uh, taken a big shears to the conduit that came in the top of the panel and just cut through the conduit, cut through the wiring, and that was it. It still has the uh, government serial number on the side. And um, some old Dymo label identification. The panel itself is a Cutler Hammer type, but again, this is, you know, pretty old. They don't make these exact series anymore. As I got it, the lens was missing, or maybe it was there but cracked and discolored. Anyway, unusable. There was no working bulb in it, but it did have the labels for the door open lamp, the open and close buttons. And the way this would work, and I got this uh, information from the curator at the museum, was you would open the door manually by pushing the button, and the door would start moving, or at least the uh, pins, I'm not sure if it was the pins of the actual door, I suppose it was the actual door. Uh, you'd push and hold it, and there might or may not have been a buzzer that went off as a warning, but certainly the door would open and you could see it was open. And uh, when the door reached fully open, a limit switch would actuate and the light would come on at that point. You could stop pushing the button. Uh, then to close it, again, you'd push it. There might or might not have been a buzzer as it was closing. Uh, and then the light would go out when it reached the, um, the closed limit for the door. And um, inside the panels, very simple, it just has these uh, push button plates and then the inside of the lens and these big old Bakelite assemblies. All the switches are actually mounted to the back of the panel which is unusual in my experience doing industrial controls Usually I expect to see these modules mounted to the back here, but apparently it was an option to mount them the other way around. Um, each of the two switches has two switches within it. Uh, so between these two terminals here and operated by this plunger is a normally open push button. And between these terminals and this one is another normally open button. Same for the uh, switch that goes with the close button, it has two independent uh, push button switches, both of which are operated in tandem by the pusher plates coming from the, uh, the button that the operator would push. The bulb is a small incandescent bulb. I presume they were originally run off of 120 volts. There's no dropping resistor or anything in this housing, although there could be in certain models. Um, and um, this is a uh, 6S6-6 volt bulb that I've put in there because I plan to run it off of a 6 volt power supply. Originally that was because I was going to run this off of batteries, but I found out that this bulb takes almost an amp uh, when it's operating and that would just kill a set of small batteries real quickly, so I switched to planning to use a small wall wart uh, power supply to use this in um, demonstration mode. And the purpose of this video, other than just to briefly talk about this panel, is to describe my method for doing some sort of demonstration simulation of the operation of the blast door so that the panel seems to do something. I can hang it on a wall or whatever, put it on a desk, and it'll be an active piece of arcane hardware. <laughs> so this is my little test rig I've set up. I was just fooling around with different things trying to decide what worked best. 
and this is what I came up with. Um, I didn't want to have wires going all over the bench, so right now I've only got two wires going to the actual light bulb. And instead of wiring the switches out, I put some little push button switches on my uh, test board here. And I decided to base the circuit around a 555 timer and a transistor and a little read relay. It's sort of a combination of electromechanical logic and solid state logic. And then because the lamp pulls so much current, uh, it was really above the capability of the read relay or any of the small transistors I had in my junk box. Uh, so instead I used this small relay here. It's just a very generic uh, small relay. Um, I forget what it's good for. I think the contacts are good for maybe 5 amps each or something. Uh, certainly more than the lamp pulls. Um, and it has a 6 volt coil, 6 volt DC coil, which is ideal. And um, I also have this little Radio Shack piezoelectric beeper, um, which is not ideal. I have on order uh, some better, uh, well, a better uh, buzzer that actually sounds more like you might imagine going as a warning with a blast door. Um, and that'll work the same way. This one runs off of 6 volts, and so will the, the little electromechanical buzzer. And that only pulls about 20 milliamps, so that'll switch through any of the circuitry I have here without any problem. Uh, so, an overview of the circuit. I've uh, cleaned up my original sketches. And this is drawn in sort of a semi-ladder diagram, semi-electronic schematic format. Um, tried to be clear with the layout. So I start up here, and it has a, a barrel connector for a 6-volt DC, 1.2 amp. Uh, wall wart power supply that I've purchased, a little switching power supply. And it cost about five or six dollars. I bought it from Digikey. Um, and again, like it has a barrel connector. And what I figured I would do is there's the hole for the original conduit, and it was facing up. But I can, I think, flip this around so that the conduit opening is on the bottom. And still have everything line up. If it doesn't, I'll work something else out. Uh, there will be a small circuit board that goes tucked in here along with the buzzer. And uh, so it'll be self-contained except for the power cord from the wall wart. And if I can, I'll get it to exit out the bottom, like I just mentioned. If I can't, then I'll live with coming out the top. I don't want to deface this by drilling extra holes in it. And I should mention that I uh, looked up the original part numbers for these for this series of switches in an old Square D catalog uh, that I got from the local Square D distributor and uh, figured out what the part number was for the original dome and the Titan Missile Museum sent me a couple of photos of unmolested ones so I knew I was getting the right one and uh, of course they're out of production but they were available through surplus sellers so I bought a couple of these actually a small bag I think I sent the rest of them to the museum for the use of the ones they had there. And then I kept this one for this panel. Anyway, so um, because these are double pole switches, as I described earlier, really two push button switches underneath each operator push button switch, I have them described here. Here's the two contacts for the open button, and here are the two contacts for the close button. Um, Relay logic wise, it's a simple lock in circuit. So you would push the open button and that would energize the coil of a relay, in this case the one I've marked OP1, and its contacts close bypassing the open switch. Never mind for the moment that I've got uh, the left hand power rail segregated, just ignore that for the moment. Uh, and this would form a lock in circuit that would, once you push this button, it would actuate the relay, the relay would self-lock in, and then that would represent a door open situation. Then you need some way to reset that, to break that lock in. Uh, and the way to do that is by removing current 
uh, or voltage from the uh, OP1 relay and that can be done in several ways as I'll describe in a moment. Uh, because that relay represents the door being fully open, I've paralleled the OP1 coil with another coil which I'm calling OP2 and that's also a 6 volt relay. This is the larger one I mentioned right here whereas the first one's a little reed relay. It could be another relay like this it's just that I had a reed relay laying around. It's actually a 5 volt reed relay but it's fine running on 6 volts. Um, if I was worried about it I could put a small resistor in series here and drop it a bit but it's fine. Um, I also have a test LED right over here uh, which is just really to to test the circuit but I'll build it into the final one anyway an LED with a 510 ohm resist uh, 510 ohm resistor which is ideal to get about 10 milliamps through that LED at 6 volts and uh, it's almost wired across the relay coils except I have a segregated um, ground here or negative rail this one here and this one here but for the purposes of this it made more sense to go to the uh, the primary negative rail or common rail. It's not really negative. Uh, so that's the way it locks in. Then for the close operation I have a normally open button. Normally you'd want to use a normally closed push button and you'd put it right about here in the circuit or it could go in this branch. Either way it would kill the lock-in and reset it to an off condition. But I don't have a normally closed switch. They're all normally open on this uh, push button panel. So I used a PNP transistor inverter circuit here, a real simple one. Um, when you're using a bipolar transistor as a switch instead of as an amplifier, uh, an NPN, when you bias its uh, input high it turns it on and it'll conduct through. With a PNP when you bias it low it will turn on. So that's what this 10k resistor does here. It's pulling the base down to the collector which in turn is uh, connected to the common supply rail. So normally this is pulled into a position of, um, of conducting and therefore the current through these relay coils has a place to get back to the common supply rail. Um, when you push the close button it, ri it raises the base of this transistor to a higher voltage. Uh, again, pretend like this is the left supply rail. It pulls it up against this resistor and that forces the transistor to temporarily turn off which de-energizes the coils which opens up this contact which breaks the lock-in. So that's essentially how the open and close buttons turn this on and off. But I want a time delay in there to simulate the opening and closing of the door. So for that I have the other contacts from the open and close buttons wired in parallel and those are wired directly to my 6 volt buzzer which is going to be a Sonalert PK24N04W-06VQ this is about an 89 decibel uh, buzzer that runs quite nicely on 6 volts at, I forget what they said, 20 or 30 milliamps, something like that. Not a lot of current. And it's about the size of four quarters stacked together, so it should fit nicely in the case. Got that on order, don't have it yet. So whenever the buttons, or either of the buttons is pushed, it's going to make the uh, buzzer sound, but it'll also energize this 555 timer circuit and uh, the reset and the V plus or VCC terminals are tied directly to this so essentially this is a power switch for this circuit whenever you're actually pushing and holding in a button it energizes the 555 circuit. Uh, the negative side or the ground of the 555 goes back to the common supply rail and then you've got this little RC in here uh, the way the 555 works in this mode, it's in monostable mode and it basically has two comparators inside which operate a set and reset flip-flop and the output of the flip-flop is the output here. So uh, I've got it marked here that when pin 2 
is less than 2 volts, it will reset the flip-flop. When pin 6 is greater than 4 volts, it'll set the flip-flop. Uh, and uh, the reason it's 2 volts and 4 volts is there's an internal voltage divider between pin 8 and pin 1, uh, which is essentially uh, three 1K resistors in series. And so since they're equal values, that picks off a one-third and a two-thirds power supply voltage, which since it's a six volt supply, that's going to give you two volts as one-third and four volts as two-thirds. Um, a capacitor, when you first apply power to it, it's not charged and it's going to act briefly as a short circuit. So when you first energize this, it's acting as a short circuit between here and here, thereby pulling these two points up to nearly six volts. Um, and that means that it's uh, above four volts and it's not above two volts. Is that right? So to clear that up a little bit, I may have been uh, mumbling around as I was trying to decide what to say. Um, I've drawn an enhancement to my schematic here that shows what happens. This is the waveform of the voltage on pins 2 and 6 uh, from the time you power the circuit up by closing these buttons till several seconds later. Uh, as I mentioned, the capacitor initially looks like a short circuit, so the voltage is yanked up to, um, I guess I can add the mark in here, VCC. It's pulled up to approximately the VCC voltage, and then it starts charging. So current is essentially moving through this resistor to charge the bottom side of the capacitor. And as that happens, the capacitor voltage increases, and since this point is held at 6 volts, if the voltage here is increasing, that means this point is decreasing. It's getting further and further away from 6 volts. And the result of that is that you've got this decreasing ramp here. It's not exactly linear. I've drawn it linear because uh, it really is just charging a capacitor through a resistor, so it has a bit of a curve to it but for the purposes of this illustration I'm showing it as a straight line. So anyway it shoots up immediately and um, since it's above the set voltage um, let's see I guess I could enhance that too can't I? Um, this is um, pin 6 And this is pin 2. Anyway, so it's at this voltage. If the voltage is above this threshold, then it will set the flip-flop. If it's below this threshold, it will not set the flip-flop. It'll reset it. If it's in between, then it's indeterminate, and the flip-flop stays wherever it is. So anyway, so the voltage shoots up here. It's not below this threshold, so it's not trying to reset the flip-flop. It is above this threshold, so it definitely sets the flip-flop. Um, and then as the voltage here decreases, it gets below this point, so it is no longer setting the flip-flop. It's in this indeterminate point, and therefore the flip-flop stays where it's at, which is set. Once it gets down to here, it falls below this threshold, and now it's definitely going to reset the flip-flop and then eventually the capacitor is fully charged and the voltage on pins 2 and 6 is essentially 0 volts or whatever the circuit common is. Um, so what does that mean? You start out with the flip-flop set and then sometime later it resets uh, a few seconds later. Uh, the pin 3 output of the 555 reacts to the output of the flip-flop, but it's essentially inverted for our purposes. Uh, when the flip-flop is set, it'll be zero volts output, 
when it's reset it'll be whatever the VCC voltage is which in this case is 6 volts. So to make that long story shorter uh, when you energize this circuit it immediately sets out with the flip-flop set and therefore there's 0 volts here. Um, some sometime later, a few seconds later, as this comes down, it uh, resets the flip-flop which causes the pin 3 output to go to uh, VCC. So, going back to the two switches here, you can see they're not really tied to the V plus rail. Instead they go to this rail, which is driven all the way back here, and it's actually driven from the output of the 555. So we know that initially when you push the buttons, this output is off, therefore there's no voltage up here, and there's nothing to energize through these two switches, whether you've pushed them or not. So let's say you've pushed the open button, you're energizing the 555 circuit, and you've closed this switch as well, but it doesn't matter because there's zero volts out here. Actually, you know, it is zero volts, the same as this, so there's no potential across here. Um, some seconds later, pin 3 turns on, and it energizes this switch. So now, current can go through here and to the relay, and the current through the relay returns to uh, the common supply rail here through the PMP transistor. The coil energizes, it closes its own contact, which is tied to the unswitched V plus rail or positive supply rail. The reason it's tied there is you don't want it to be dependent on the 555 timer. You want it to be locked in regardless of what the 555 does. So that's why it goes all the way over here. Then you see the light come on because closing uh, or energizing OP1 also energizes OP2. It has a contact down here which connects from the plus supply rail through the contact, through the uh, light bulb, and back to the minus supply rail or common supply rail. So then the light is on, you know the door is fully open and you take your finger off the buttons. Uh, at that point this part stays locked in the coils of the relays are energized and the light bulb stays on. It'll stay on as long as you don't do something else or remove the power supply. Now you come along sometime later and you want to close the door, so you close or you push the close button and again it wants to do something this with, with this transistor but it can't because this is at zero volts. So even if you push this button all it's doing is reinforcing what this resistor is doing. It's pulling the base of the transistor down to zero volts and the transistor stays on and this whole circuit continues working. But now your finger is on the button holding the close down and as the 555 timer does its thing and eventually energizes this, now you've got a positive voltage coming through here and it drags the base up against the uh, will of this resistor and that turns the transistor off, it stops conducting, the relays are de-energized and the whole thing drops out and returns to normal. So um, with that said, let me demonstrate this. Um, like I said before, I have this wired out with a couple of buttons. This button up here takes the place of these two buttons wired in parallel. This button here is this open button, and this button down here is this close button. So if I push the two left ones, or the common one and the left one, it's opening. The common button and the right one is closing. And I've got the, the screamer hooked up here. And I'm going to look at my oscilloscope, which is monitoring the pins 2 and 6 voltage, so you can see what happens with that. So I got my fingers on the buttons. You see it jumped up there and it's now coming down. And there's a little glitch there, um, but it continues coming down. And now I can release my uh, fingers from the buttons. And you'll see during that time the light came on. The reason there's that little glitch is because I don't have any power supply decoupling right here at this. And there's a lot of current drawn when this light bulb turns on that causes a very momentary sag of voltage 
at this because even though the power supply over here is doing its best to supply 6 volts at up to 1.3 amps, there is little voltage drops in the leads and so on and that causes a shift in the voltage divider circuit and that makes the whole thing bounce a little bit on the scope screen. Um, that also causes momentary chattering um, of the uh, piezo beeper and you can hear that a little bit too. Um, so let's push the close button and see that the timer does the same thing again. It jumps up and then it drifts down and you can hear maybe a click there and it keeps coming down. When I release it the capacitor is always discharged fully um, and it does that because there's a circuit connected to it which draws power and it will self discharge pretty quickly. Um, the buzzer also works to discharge the capacitor because of how it's connected. Um, if I don't have that buzzer in there it takes a little longer for the capacitor to self recharge or self discharge after I remove power. So having that buzzer there is actually a perk as far as the performance of the circuit goes. Um, now this is 2 volts per division so this is power supply voltage here. So again you can see it jump up to power supply voltage. It went right up there and it works really quickly at the bottom and then it kinda slows down its uh, charging as it goes on. And that's because in reality this is not a linear circuit. It actually um, works, works more like this. The shape of the curve is more like this. That's why you see a lot of change. There's a rapid change here, but then as time goes on the curve is more like this, so you see less of a voltage change over time as you get out over to here. But we're not concerned because all we care about really is how long does it take to get from here to this point and the capacitor and resistor have been chosen to give approximately the right time delay for this demonstration. Um, so let's watch it with the light now. The light's on, I'm pushing the close button. And the reason that the, the beeper does that is because as the remaining charge on the capacitor is bled off, by the rest of the circuit and by the buzzer, uh, it still has a bit of voltage. Uh, it quickly drops away, but it's continuing to try to make its tone, and it kind of goes eh, like that. Um, so let's watch it uh, turning it on now, pushing the buttons. And there we go. And turning it off again. So if you imagine that going during the opening, I think it'll be more satisfying. Anyway, um, I've proved that this circuit works. It resets pretty quickly, so I can um, immediately close it after opening it, and it'll work properly. And if I don't let it go all the way open, I push it for a couple seconds and release it, push it for a couple more seconds, it takes the full amount of time to open it. So it does not react to a momentary press of the button. You have to hold it long enough to actually open the door. Is that a complete 100% simulation? No it isn't. It's just there to make the panel do something approximately correct with as little stuff as possible. So, um, this is the educational part of the video, and now I'm going to wait for my other parts to come in. I'm going to build up a little perf board. Uh, oh, by the way, here's my um, LED. This is my test LED. I don't have the right resistor in there right now, so it's running a little dim. But that will be on the circuit board, and if the light bulb, for example, burns out or something, the circuit can still be tested for operation by looking at the LED. Um, I figure this is going to be about a two and a half by two and a half inch little perf board. Uh, lash up job. It has very few components really. Even though it looks like a lot on the schematic, you can see here that there's not that much to it. And it'll definitely fit on a small board. 
and that'll just tuck inside here pretty nicely. Uh, the wall wart can be left on all the time, so anytime I feel the urge, I can operate the panel to demonstrate it or just pretend like I'm back in a silo in the Cold War. Uh, I don't have anything as extravagant as a launch control console. This is going to have to suffice. Uh, so, while I'm sitting here yakking about this, a couple of design decisions. Why did I do it the way I did it? Originally, I was going to use a circuit... Um, let me see if I can find it here. It was going to be a bit more like this when it was still going to be battery powered and before I realized that wasn't going to work. And um, I was going to use some diode logic in here. So pushing the open button would supply to the buzzer and the timer circuit through a diode and then through another diode to the open relay which then of course locks itself in and bypasses the, the open. Um, that's all well and good. And then the close button also diode couples through to the buzzer and the timer. It can't go backwards through the diode to operate this, so that's all fine. Uh, just for symmetry, I put a diode here, even though it's not really necessary, to the close coil. The problem is that the relays that I wanted to use only have open contacts, so I can't use that close relay contact to break the circuit in any way over here. Um, so, and I don't have a normally closed button to use either, so this wouldn't, this would have worked just fine, except that, um, I don't have a way to get an inversion out of this. I could put a relay in that has a normally closed contact and then put that down here to break this. Um, that would have worked, but I didn't have that relay initially in mind. I was going to use just, um read relays and all the ones I have just have open contacts. Um, so then I said, well, number one, I can't power this off a of battery because the bulb takes too much power and the bulb would have connect been connected over here. Um, and uh, oh yeah, the reason this diode is in here is so when this open contact latches in, it powers the coil here, but it cannot back feed through to keep the buzzer going indefinitely even after the doors open. So that's why that diode's there. But I made the decision it can't be battery powered because the lamp takes too much current, uh, therefore it's going to be a wall wart, and then I said, well, the lamp is too big to power through a contact of another read relay. I could put another one in, in parallel here to operate the lamp, or I could just put the lamp right here. Um, but again, it takes too much power, and for the read relay, it would have damaged the contacts over time. So I said I need to have a separate relay just to run the lamp current, the coils in parallel with that separate relay. But I still need the inversion over here, um, and so I have to do some extra circuitry to invert this so that it'll reset this. And then I actually took a look inside this panel, which I hadn't done before. I assumed. It was just one contact. I realized it had two contacts, and then the light bulb went off. I said I can eliminate all this diode logic just by having the two sets of contacts actually pull their weight. One set of contacts runs the, the relay lock-in circuit, and one set runs the timer. That gets rid of all the diodes. And originally I did build this with um, a relay having an inverted contact or a normally closed contact, but it wasn't the relay I wanted to use. And then I said, well, why don't I just use a transistor, a PMP transistor to invert the push button and get the inversion that way. And that's simpler and uses one less relay. Um, I thought about using a power transistor, which I could have done, instead of using a second relay to power this. But I don't have any in my junk box. I couldn't quickly test it. So I said, I do have the little relays laying around, and I don't need to heat sink it or anything. And I could have done something with a transistor here to perform the lock-in function instead of using a read relay. Um, but again, had read, re read relays laying around, and it just seemed simpler and less screwing around to do it this way. Um, so really, two small relays, a transistor, a couple of resistors, a capacitor, a 555, hardly any components, really low cost, simple and reliable, easy to understand. So I'm going to continue this video once I've actually got something to build up.
Oh yeah, before I get to that, I want to show you what the current's actually doing here. This circuit's pulling about two milliamps uh, until I push the buttons. Then it goes up to about eight milliamps because that's what the buzzer is taking. And then when it switches on, it goes up to 900 milliamps or 0.9 amps, which is what the light bulb's taking. And then when I de-energize the 555, it drops down slightly less because it's not taking current for that or the buzzer. Um, so it goes up a little bit because the buzzer and the 555 is on, and now it drops back down to that. Well, as it turns out, these are easily swappable. Just a couple of screws, and it's a consistent adapter bracket, so these will go like this, and therefore I can turn the panel upside down, still have the light on the top, and now the conduit entry on the bottom. And for anyone interested, here is the DigiKey part number and the manufacturer part number of the power supply I got. It says 5.9 volts. It's a, another CUI power supply. There we go. Universal input. Output 5.9 volts, close enough to the 6 volts I need. 1.2 amps. Should do the trick. And here's the uh, manufacturer number that's Mallory Sone Alert and the DigiKey part number for the buzzer. And there's the actual part. And I've got my power supply set up. Um, it just doesn't show up well on the video camera that light blue with white text on it, but it's 6 volts. I've got it limited to 1.3 amps. And that's a little closer to the sound I was looking for. And it is pulling just above 30 milliamps. So that's good. And here's the information on the barrel jack that I bought to go with the power supply. It's um, Memory Protection Devices is the brand. There's their part number and the DigiKey part number. And here's the piece of vector board I bought. Um, that's their part number. It's a 4x4. Four four. And uh, there's the DigiKey part number in the upper left. So I want to mount this barrel jack inside this hole and I don't want to modify the case in any way since it's a historical artifact. So I was thinking I would just take three short bolts and some washers and nuts, make a a plate to go inside of here with a hole for the uh, barrel jack and then secure it with three bolts that go just inside the circle here and uh, either are tapped into or or have a nut on the other side here and that should lock it in center and hold it there um, with just the grip from the heads on the the edges. That's assuming I do everything with uh, careful enough tolerances that it fits well. So I have uh, some of these. They're a little bit, I don't know, they're a bit less than a sixteenth of an inch thick aluminum and uh, they came off of old Radio Shack project boxes that I used to use a lot of. I never used these covers. They had plastic and metal covers and I usually for the projects I was doing used the plastic covers so I have a lot of these left over and they make nice little pieces of aluminum for making various brackets and little things like that so that's what I'm going to carve up to do this. So here's the um, pieces I've cut it out. It's a little bit hard to see but it fits in nicely 
between the folded flanges that the uh, sheet metal box uses, including that uh, mounting flange, so it seats in there pretty nice. That will keep it from shifting sideways, and all I need to do now is uh, find the locations for these three screws. And uh, so I've got the piece taped in there, and now I can make my measurements and marks. All right, so there's the plate, and it's uh, got 832 tapped holes for the screws or the bolts, and the clearance hole for the jack. So here's how that worked out. Holds the jack nice and steady in the middle, and I have not modified the piece of historical art um, artifact here. So I'm using a really large piece of perf board. It could be about half that size, but I wanted to mount the uh, sewn alert on it, and that defined its height. Uh, I didn't really want to pack things any more closely this way, and the layout that I arranged so there were short leads interconnecting things worked best with the parts in a pretty much linear layout, so I went with uh, the full width of the board, it just fit, and uh, about two inches this way. So now I have to drill some holes for the sun alert and, and shear this off. So the board's the right size and the sun alert's mounted on it. Well, it ain't pretty, but it should be functional. Okay, the thing's all wired up now. Hopefully I made all the connections correctly. I'm going to test it with just the LED. So I've got my uh, wall wart plugged in over there. I'm going to plug it in down here. And hit the open button. didn't latch in. Okay. Well, the buzzer's working and the LED's working. That means the timer's working. But I'm not getting the lock in, so I have to diagnose that. Well, this is all well and good, um, but it wasn't working quite properly. Um, I was actually cheating a little bit there with my circuit. Um, normally, if you use a PNP bipolar transistor as a switch, it wants to be on the high side of the load, and I was using it on the low side of the load like you'd normally use an NPN transistor. and um, the way I had it uh, set up with its base resistor, it was working on my breadboard just fine. Um, when I translated it over to the working circuit board, uh, the transistor was turning on, but it wasn't turning on enough. And um, this was resulting in the, uh, the relay coil getting a little bit too little voltage. The voltage wasn't quite enough on the coil for the relay to turn on, so everything would work except that the circuit wouldn't lock in like it was supposed to. Now I was able to tweak the base resistor and get it to work, but I th started thinking this is kind of a crappy way of doing it really, and all I'm really trying to do was save a little relay, uh, which would have been a simpler solution. Um, so I went back around and thought about it some more and I said, you know, if somebody's going to build this, or in my case, if I'm going to build it as a permanent thing, um, I have the relays. It's not like I'm really trying to save anything here. And if somebody else was going to build it, they can buy a couple of relays. The things are like a buck a piece or something. It's not a big deal. So um, I rebuilt it on a different breadboard here much simpler um, and now when I 
turn the circuit on. I get my LED which is across the coil of the lock-in or my LED which is across the coil of the lock-in relay and then when I de-energize it after the time delay it de-energizes. So that's working very nicely. The relays are all getting the proper voltage on their coils. I think this can be more robust. Um, and the only thing I need to do is just verify with the buzzer, but I don't have any doubt that that's going to work. The other thing that I've done here is the contact ratings on these relays, and I'll provide the part number in the video in a little bit. Um, conservative Conservatively speaking, they're good for one amp. Um, the lamp doesn't pull one amp, and this is a resistive load. Resistively, this is a three amp contact on here, so it's more than adequate. I had the relay contacts doubled up when I first built this version, which isn't really necessary. Therefore, I can use one pair of contacts on the relay for the lock-in circuit, and the other pair to switch the lamp. Uh, and thereby saving the read relay. So I'm still using two relays. Here I had a read relay and a bigger relay for switching the lamp. Here I have a single relay that does the lock-in and switches the lamp. And then the second relay provides the inversion um, that the transistor provided in this version. So parts count is actually lower. Cost isn't substantially different. And let's try that again. So I'm going to build this up, but I also was not fond of this. Um, I really hate to do work that way. Uh, if it's a circuit more complicated than just a couple of parts, and I thought, boy, if I ever have to change anything on this, it's going to be a royal pain. Um, so instead, I think I'm going to etch up a little circuit board. I haven't hand etched a board in years, but I thought I would include that on this video just for fun. The things necessary for basic uh, home circuit board etching are some copper clad circuit boards. And this is a pack of, I guess, 10 of them. They're something like 2 inches by f a little bit less than 4 inches. Um, I think these are all MG Chemicals part numbers. I bought them on Amazon, but they're sold by lots of places. A bottle of ferric chloride solution. And uh, some sort of way of putting etch resist on the circuit boards. I have here also from MG Chemicals some rub-on etch resist patterns. So this gives me holes and uh, pads for circuit uh, ICs and things like that. And uh, some sort of a burnishing tool. You could really use a ballpoint pen for this, but uh, this is sort of like a ballpoint pen without the ink. I've used this for years to do transfer lettering and dry transfers. And then you need a, a fine and a thick uh, Sharpie marker for the rest of the traces. So these boards I got are uh, two and three quarter by just under four inches. I think it's really a metric size, or they're just not cut accurately. They are um, FR4 fire resistant fiberglass, roughly one sixteenth of an inch thick with copper cladding on one side only, which is what I want. So single-sided circuit board. And I've marked it here for uh, cutting down to the required two by four inches. So before I go any further, I'm going to go down and use my metal shear to cut this. If you were to do something like this yourself, uh, you could use a saw or anything that would cut the fiberglass. Um, but since I have a shear, I'm going to use that. So I've got the board cut down and uh, it's always useful to have some of this very light abrasive. Um, this is just what I had laying around. Uh, extremely fine sandpaper will work, but I really like using the Scotch-Brite product or 
the generic version of it, which is a abrasive plastic kind of steel wool type of stuff. Actually, you can use steel wool too for this. Um, I don't like using it if I have the Scotch Brite type of product available, simply because uh, it does tend to leave little conductive slivers laying around, and if you don't get them all cleaned off, you could have problems. Whereas with the Scotch Brite stuff, it's not conductive, it's just got that benefit going for it. Anyway, so I've just polished the board a little bit uh, just to get off any uh, oxidation from storage. And uh, the other thing, you've got to come up with some sort of a layout, which I'm going to do now, just using some uh, notebook paper. I usually just start with a really rough sketch showing a top view of the components and an arrangement I think is going to work pretty well and then uh, penciling in the connections. Again, the foils are going to be on the bottom, but for the purpose of this design study, I'm viewing it from the top. So I've got a wire from the positive power supply going to two pins on the relay. I've got uh, the positive side of the lamp coming off the relay. I've got the uh, wire from the open push button going to the plus side of the coil of this relay and also one of its contacts and also to a current limiting resistor and an LED which then returns to the negative side of this relay and all of that ends up going into the normally closed contact on the second relay which then returns to circuit ground and this is the ground connection of the power supply it's also the negative side of the lamp terminates there. The negative side of the buzzer terminates there through a circuit board foil. And the um, ground pin of the 555 timer is connected there. And um, then the two circuit or the two push buttons which are used in parallel to control the timer, their wire comes in here and it provides power to pin 8 of the 555 timer and also goes to the positive side of the timing capacitor and also to the plus side of the buzzer and uh, to pin 4 which is a reset pin on the 555 um, and then the RC junction here between the timing resistor and the timing capacitor those are tied together and that also goes to the uh, two intermediate pins, pins 2 and 6, which are the comparator inputs on the uh, 555. So really that's the whole thing. It's going to be a super simple circuit board layout and um, the circuit board could be made considerably smaller, but I'm making it big enough to mount the buzzer to with this layout all the uh, parts, the big parts anyway, the two relays and the 555 are all going to go end to end and that's going to take up most of the the uh, four inch width here. So the other parts either go above or below where there's tons of room. Now this is a relic from the dark ages um, when I used to lay out circuit boards professionally. I had um, this was before you could get reasonable software to do it like everybody would use now but I'm showing the old-fashioned crude way of doing it at home here with minimal resources um, this just helps lay out the board because it has uh, typical sizes of components with their uh, pinouts in the correct locations it helps lay out a circuit board if you're just doing it on paper these, uh, this is a one-to-one -one here, so it's actual size. I also used to lay out boards in double size and four size, and I had similar uh, templates like this for both of those scales as well. And translating from that to actual size, again this is a top view, plenty of real estate on the board, real simple layout to do with a resist pin. All I really need is the dots from the the transfer set for the uh, IC sockets and uh, the rest could be done very crudely. 
So now I have to flip that over and do the layout onto the actual circuit board using the dry transfers and the um, etch resist pen. Here are the uh, sheets of the rub-on etch resist from MG Chemical. You get a variety of dots of different sizes for resistors and other pads. There is a uh, sheet of tabs for surface mount ICs and through hole ICs. This is generally kind of useless, <laughs> but you could use them for various things. This is for edge connectors primarily. And this is if you're going to make your lines straight instead of using them uh, curvy and using the edge resist pen. And then there's various patterns that you can use for transistors and small old-fashioned op amps. And then there's this one sheet that you can just use for, I don't know, like making ground planes or something. After rubbing through the sheet, the idea is should be able to carefully lift the transfer sheet off and just the pads I want stay on the board. Now the way you're supposed to do this is immediately lay the backing paper down. Uh, there's a sort of a waxy side and a, uh, a smooth side. You lay the smooth side against the pads so it doesn't try to lift them off again and then burnish them again through the sheet. By the way, I don't find that this MG Chemicals product is all that good. It, it looks on the surface to be comparable to the stuff I used to use, but maybe this is just old stock, but when I peel the transfer sheets off the backing paper, a lot of the stuff just sticks to the backing paper. Yeah, I would uh, started using this MG Chemicals product just for this project because uh, <clears throat> the stuff I used to use, I actually bought it from Radio Shack and they had them in these packages like this. This was an excellent product. I still have some of it, but it's really old and I was worried that it wouldn't be good. It was probably better than this stuff from MG Chemicals, so uh, I really had a hard time with this thing. It, the it would stick to the backing paper, it wouldn't stick to the board, it would tear, it would... It's just a mess. So I'm hoping it works well as an etch resist now that I've spent about four or five times the expected time just doing it. Um, anyway, the thing you've got to remember when you're doing these boards is that it's, it's flipped. So, um, you know, like these holes here correspond to the holes there. And these holes here correspond to the holes there, and everything else is flipped, so you got to look at it really carefully that way. And now I'm going to use the, uh, the Sharpie pen, which is a good etch resist, um, to draw the lines on there. So there's the very simple pattern that I made. Uh, and uh, just to make the etching go quicker, what I usually do on here is fill in a lot of the empty space with um, resist, just so there's less copper to um, etch away. So there is the board ready for etching. Some of the big blank areas filled in, some various text added to identify the points where wiring gets added, which places pin one on each IC or relay. Um, I usually put a date on there for when I make the board. And um, now it just needs to be etched. I usually just use a uh, Pyrex, like a casserole dish or something, something made out of glass, and I put it on a hot plate. You don't really need to do that, but it works faster. The etching takes place quicker if you can warm things up a little bit. And then we just put the ferric chloride solution in there. So I'm just letting it get a little bit warmed up here. I don't need to make it boiling hot. And just slip the board in there.
this stuff will stain permanently and it'll corrode any metal so you don't want to be wearing good clothes when you do this you want eye protection you want to have something absorbent in case you make a spill to get it up right away ideally you should wear rubber gloves and it's good to agitate the solution a little bit too or at least, at least move the uh, board around in the solution a bit with something uh, plastic one thing I usually like to do is just tip the uh, solution back and forth to get a bit of agitation and by doing that you can kind of get a better view of how the etching is going on. Well here's what happens when you start talking about the etch resist instead of looking at the etching process itself carefully enough I left it in there for too long and uh, the areas covered up by the pads did quite well but the areas covered up by the the Sharpie pen, um, which usually holds up quite well, that was uh, eroded away and the fact that I was heating the, uh, the ferric chloride solution made that happen even worse. So I have to redo this board, much as I hate to. Okay, here's the redone circuit board. Okay, and now a quick test. <clears throat> This is opening. Okay, let's look at what's going on with this circuit. I've got roughly six volts. It's one volt per division. There's ground. And when I energize the circuit, it holds just fine, but as soon as the lamp is engaged, it pulls down to about a volt for half a second, which resets the timer. And of course the relays don't pull in. If I just let it cycle like this, eventually the lamp filament will warm up enough that the inrush current isn't so high, and eventually it'll work. And uh, I tried putting a bunch of big electrolytic capacitors across the power supply to see if I could satisfy the inrush, but I didn't have enough of them to be able to accomplish that. And the size was getting ridiculous. On the other hand, if I use my bench power supply and I have my drifty scope here. Okay, now I've got it current limited to one amp even though it doesn't want to show up very well on the display. And this uh, CUI wall ward I've been using is rated for 1.2 amps. But even with this limited to one amp on the bench supply, it does sag, but it doesn't sag nearly so much, and the circuit does work that way. Turn it off. Turn it on. You can see it sag, but it's still to the point where the uh, 555 does not reset and the relays do pull in. So what I really need here is something that um, is more robust. Now I can turn my supply up here so it's limited to 1.3 amps and try it again. Let me reset it first. Okay, now turning it on. 
you can see there was a lot less sag. And if I adjust the bench supply up to, say, one point, well, let's just go for two amps. Turn it off again. Turning it on. Basically, no drop. So, I have an underrated Walwart power supply here, which doesn't even really quite do what the label suggests. Now, I just went with the DigiKey uh, rating, which is uh, 1.2 amps maximum, but there's no specification for inrush here, and I did not check it out um, with the CUI spec sheet. If I had, I would probably find out that it's... Uh, ability to satisfy current surges or inrush is very limited. So I need to replace this with a beefier power supply with a better uh, ability to deliver its full rated current during inrush conditions. These are the replacement relays that are just like the originals, but they have 12 volt DC coils. This is the replacement uh, barrel connector power socket to fit the new power supply. And this is the new power supply, 12 volts, 60 watts. This one's rated for up to 5 amps, so hopefully it can handle uh, the greater surge current, plus as a 12 volt circuit it should have a bit less surge current than the 6 volt circuit just because the impedances are higher. Okay, this is the revised schematic. 12 volts DC comes in here. I'm suggesting power supply should be good for at least a couple amps. Just so it has a better chance of handling the inrush current. There is the open button. It has two poles and the close button has two poles. And there's two positive power rails and two negative or common rails. This one here is unswitched right off the power supply. This one is switched and is driven from the output of the 555 timer IC. This rail here comes directly off the negative side of the power supply and it's the circuit common. And this power rail here as mentioned is already mentioned is switched and that's the same as this line here so there's really only three lines just one wraps around. So when first energized, nothing happens. Uh, when the open button is pushed, it closes here and here. It would try to power the LED and CR1 relay, except that there is no power on this switched supply rail. Um, so nothing happens up here right away. But this here being closed from the positive supply rail energizes the buzzer which sounds immediately as soon as the button is pressed and remains on as long as the button is held. Along with that the 555 timer circuit is powered up. Here's an illustration of what happens to the voltage at this point in the circuit. Normally it's essentially at the negative or common supply rail. As soon as the 555 power is turned on, the voltage on pins 2 and 6 jumps up to the positive supply rail or VCC, and then as the capacitor discharge or charges, the voltage makes a curve like this and returns to essentially 0 volts or the common voltage. The pins 2 and 6 in the IC are monitoring that voltage and they have two thresholds. They have a 4 volt threshold 
which is one third of the 12 volt VCC voltage and there's the 8 volt threshold which is two thirds of the VCC voltage. As long as the voltage here is greater than 8 volts the output flip-flop is set. So during this part of the curve the output is set because the voltage is higher than this threshold here. And I guess I could help out by marking what that voltage is. 8 volts and 4 volts. Okay, that's better. Once the voltage drops below 8 volts, it's not being set or reset, it just remains where it was, which is set and then when the voltage drops below the 4 volt threshold which is measured via pin 2 then the internal flip-flop is reset and it then stays reset until the next time you remove power from the circuit and repower it at which point this whole thing repeats. Um, in the context of this circuit when the internal flip-flop is set the pin 3 output is 0 volts when the internal flip-flop is reset the pin 3 voltage is VCC or 12 volts in this case. So we know that the flip-flop is set during the initial part of the operation when the button has been pressed and after a few seconds as this voltage drops down to here then the internal flip-flop is reset and the output turns on to VCC or 12 volts that comes around here and now it energizes this circuit. You go through the push button which is still being pressed and held by the the operator and the test LED and the CR1 relay are energized and as soon as CR1 is energized its contacts here close which provides an alternate power path directly off the unswitched power rail so it doesn't even need this path anymore it's going to go straight through here and it locks itself in as long as there's power available um, at this point CR1 has another contact down here which takes the positive supply rail and energizes the 12 volt incandescent light to say that uh, or lamp to say that the door is open at that point the operator no longer needs to press the button and he releases it which de-energizes this but because the circuit is locked in it stays locked in however this contact is open and there are the, for the buzzer and the 555 uh, five circuit are de-energized so it stops buzzing and this uh, 555 voltage sequence resets and it remains in this state indefinitely as long as there's a power supply with the um, buzzer off and the door open lamp illuminated when the operator wishes to close the door he presses the close button which closes this contact and this contact once again this can't do anything because this point is de-energized um, but this button contact down here does the same thing as it did when the open button is pressed it sounds the buzzer immediately the 555 circuit runs its timed sequence at the end of that time sequence the output is energized it wraps around and now it can go through a uh, current can go through this close button energize relay CR2 which has only one purpose and that's to open its normally closed contacts here which breaks this circuit kills the lock in of the relay and this resets back to its original state at that point the um, because CR1 is now reset and turned off these contacts down here open, the door open lamp de-energizes and it is no longer illuminated. The operator knows the door is closed and he releases the button which silences the buzzer, resets the 555 circuit 
and it's ready for the next repeated sequence. So that has some advantages to the slightly more complex circuit I had originally. Both circuits used two relays, um, but in the original circuit the two of them were in parallel. One of them performed the lock-in operation and the other one had only one purpose and that was to switch the current for the incandescent lamp. The inversion function for canceling the lock-in was handled through a inverting NPN circuit driven off the close button and in the revised circuit it's handled with the second relay since CR1 has two contacts it can use one contact for the lock-in and the other contact to operate the lamp. Therefore, the second relay, all it has to do is provide the inversion function to cancel the lock-in, doing the job of the transistor and resistor that was there before. The advantages of that are that this is a simpler circuit, it's easier to understand, and it works better <laughs> than this circuit, which I was trying to keep very simple and uh, even though a this part of the circuit worked properly because this circuit really opt operates optimally when it's on the supply side of the load instead of the uh, bottom side of the load in other words it should be sinking or sourcing current instead of sinking current like it's doing here it was basically working but it wouldn't turn on to full saturation and therefore it was not conducting 100% in this application. It worked on my breadboard and I thought it was going to be okay but um, in in practice when I built the circuit for real the voltage on the relay coils was just a little bit too low for them to pull in reliably. Sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. So that circuit either needed to be enhanced I could have done it with a two transistor circuit, I maybe could have reorganized this in some way to make it work um, but I decided it wasn't worth the headache and it was easier to just reorganize CR1 to do two jobs and have CR2 handle the inversion and reset function. Otherwise the 555 timer circuit is identical and the rest of it works the same. Um, I did go to 12 volts on this not for a functional reason but simply because once I found out how much current how much inrush current the incandescent bulb was pulling and that it was overwhelming my 6 volt supply uh, I needed to go to a beefier power supply that would have a better chance of handling the inrush without its voltage dipping too much um, and there was no power supply available with that much current capacity at only 6 volts they always started at 9 volts and that's a non-standard voltage for things like relay coils. So I had to go to the next standard voltage, which was 12 volts. So the power supply became 12 volts. The two relays became 12 volt coil types. I had to change the resistor value on the LED to limit its current to the desired value at the higher supply voltage. I didn't have the 12 volt version of the SonAlert buzzer on hand, and I didn't want to order a new one so I just put a dropping resistor in to get it uh, in the ballpark at 7.2 volts or whatever it is that it's getting with that value of resistor works fine. The 555 circuit doesn't care at all whether it's 6 volts or 12 volts it works exactly the same way and of course the incandescent bulb had to be a 12 volt version now instead of a 6 volt version. Well, here's the revised circuit board. Um, I plugged in the 12 volt relays and I changed the resistor value for the LED to account for the higher supply voltage. I added a 150 ohm resistor in series with the buzzer to drop its voltage from 12 volts to somewhere closer to its nominal 6 volts. It's just an electromagnetic buzzer so it's not gonna fry if it's running at 7 volts or something. And um, now I just have to take one of my new 12 volt bulbs. I hope these are what I think they are. It sure looks like it says 120 volts 
on here it's really hard to read. I'll be ticked off if they send me 120 volt bulbs. These are the uh, 6S6 12 volt bulbs. Um, they came in right from the other supplier as opposed to the cheap low quality and 120 volt ones that I got from the first supplier. So let's see if that works. And I have a sheet of mylar here with the edge bent over. Um, this could be a piece of cardboard, but I have mylar, so I'm using it. And the mylar covers up the back side of the circuit board and also folds under the bottom lip since I made the uh, some of the connector foils a little bit close to the bottom. And now this just sort of tucks in here like this. One final test before buttoning it up. can also see that the LED is on which is useful if the for testing it if the incandescent bulb is burned out or removed and then Well, I was in for a rude awakening when I went to put this all together. Turns out these uh, old Cutler Hammer boxes are not symmetrical. And there was just no way to still have the lamp at the top and have the uh, power come out the bottom. No matter how I flipped it around, things weren't lining up. It's really strange. I guess they did that to kind of key the boxes, but the ones I'm familiar with in more modern manufacture are all symmetrical. You can have them either way. I don't want to drill a hole in this box. My whole goal here is to not modify the original artifact. So I'm going to have to live with the power cord coming out the top. Well, the uh, buzzer's not quite as loud as I'd hoped it would be coming through the metal. It's actually gasketed, so it's no surprise. But the only way to get it louder is to uh, cut holes in the panel or do something drastic like that. And once again, goal is not to modify the artifact, so having the buzzer a little quieter than I would have preferred is okay. So a lot of to do for not a whole lot here but in the end it worked and I think the project is a success now I just have to find some place to mount this for display well I decided to improve the buzzer anyway by putting a few air holes in the uh, plate for the uh, power jack they're not very precisely done but there's the three main holes and then there's three groups of three they were more or less in a straight line. I let the drill wander a little bit, but oh well. And I had enough slack wire in here to relocate the circuit board to the opposite corner of the case so the buzzer's up 
close to the uh, air holes in there. We'll see how that works. Well, it is a little bit louder for having those holes in there. It's not dramatic, but it's definitely an improvement.